Hello everyone. Thanks for joining us at our Material Characterization webinar session. Today, we'll discuss advances on dynamic vapor and surface characterization techniques in sorption science. This is our first session and we will focus on the dynamic vapor sorption technique in detail from theory to common applications. In our second session, we will place more emphasis on the inverse gas chromatography technique and its application for the physical chemical characterization of materials. Our presenter today will be Dr. Majid Naduri. Majid is our lab manager and one of our senior application scientists at Surface Measurement Systems. His academic background includes a master in petrochemicals and a PhD in physical chemistry with over 15 years of experience in material characterization. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to send us all the questions. We are ready to start. I'll pass it on to Majid now. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, and good morning, everyone. Uh, for this session, I'll be going through <clears throat> an introduction to dynamic vapor absorption for materials characterization. Uh, for the first few slides, I'll just go through the principles and an int introduction to the system, followed by applications and examples. Generally, for the characterization of solids, uh, there are different methods, characterization methods available. Uh, common, common ones uh, include uh, spectroscopic techniques, which use energy as a probe, like X-rays or lasers. Uh, and these will give you analytical and structural information. Or you could use heat as a probe, like a uh, calorimetry, which will give you thermodynamic information. But with the dynamic vapor absorption technique, uh, we use molecules as a probe. And uh, this is a absorption technique, which will give you thermodynamic, chemical, as well as structural information. Now, using molecules as a probe, uh, molecules can uh, either be absorbed onto the surface or be absorbed into the bulk. And the way the, the molecules are absorbed and the way they come off the material uh, will give you a wide range of information through absorption and desorption isotherms. So where, where can vapor absorption occur? Vapor absorption can be on the surface of the material, in the pores, micropores, mesopores, uh, between the particles, in the form of condensation uh, absorbed into the bulk of the material or chemically react to form hydrate or solvate if you are using a, an organic vapor. Uh, generally, the kind of information you get from absorption processes include the stability of materials at different vapor concentrations. Uh, vapor solid inter interactions in general are important for a wide range of industries, including food, pharma, proteins, fuel cells, packaging materials, high energy materials like explosives, personal care like uh, shampoo conditioners, and uh, fabric conditioners, as well as the interaction between fabrics and fragrances. So accurately determining water absorption isotherm is obviously a critical uh, uh, process for proper development and storage of the materials. Uh, the older, some of the older techniques available are generally used for measuring moisture content only, and they wouldn't give you a full isotherm, absorption, desorption isotherm. And these methods uh, include loss on drying, which basically involves weighing the sample, heating it, and re-weighing it to see how much water has been lost. Uh, obviously, there is a risk of contamination as well as sample loss and a human error in, in this method. Carl Fisher technique is a titration method and determines water only and not the volatile substances or any other substances uh, coming off the material. Uh, it's a destructive method and obviously samples can't be used uh, after the analysis. 
and generally it's not ideal, uh, an ideal method, especially for food materials as um, uh, water is uh, released slowly and with difficulty. More common technique, jar method, is a static gravimetric method where uh, different jars are used and uh, um, a room full of jars sometimes are, are used with different saturated salt solutions in them to provide different percentage relative humidities. Uh, and this is a very slow technique. It could um, take months, weeks or months to get a, um, an isotherm. It's very labor intensive and a large amount of sample is required. And it, it involves obviously different types of errors, including uh, weighing errors and so contamination. So the difference now with the, with the static methods and the dynamic methods is that the way the uh, molecules interact with the, with the surface. Uh, with the static method, you have a limited number of molecules interacting with the surface, uh, and it's, that's the reason why equilibrium is established uh, slowly, and you also uh, use a small, uh, larger amount of sample, and uh, obviously as you take the sample out and uh, wait, there's a risk of contamination and error. Whereas with the dynamic vapor absorption technique, uh, uh, you achieve fast equilibrium uh, through uh, the flow of molecules over uh, over the sample. So it's, you don't introduce as uh, static um, volume of uh, molecules to the, to the material, but you have a flow of vapor over the material constantly and therefore achieving fast equilibrium, better diffusion into the system. Only small amount of sample in the sort of milligram range, uh, sometimes as depending on the uptake, as small as one milligram uh, can be used. Uh, and the sample is in, in, in a sample chamber and there's no risk of contamination or sample loss. And the microbalance with a 0.1 microgram accuracy is used to monitor the changes in the mass of the sample. Here is a schematic diagram of the system. Uh, the dry gas is introduced to the system through a series of mass flow controllers, very accurate mass flow controllers and uh, the dry gas bubbles through uh, the um, water reservoir or uh, vapor reservoir and uh, generates saturated vapor which is then mixed with dry gas uh, to uh, generate the required uh, target uh, <coughs> concentration which is then introduced in the, into the sample chamber and the reference pan chamber. Uh, this is where the sample is introduced to the uh, vapor generation and um, uh, a camera underneath the sample chamber can take images of the sample at different uh, relative humidities or vapor concentrations. The concentration of the vapor is monitored using a, a humidity vapor sensor. This is basically a, um, a chilled mirror uh, detector. Um, and uh, also there are uh, ports available on the side of the sample chamber uh, for Raman or UV probes to be connected to the system so you can do spectroscopy at the same of the uh, gravimetric analysis of the sample. Uh, the microbalance uh, obviously uh, monitors the mass loss in the sample. There are different versions of the system available. The, uh, the basic one includes the uh, DVS intrinsic, which has got a temperature range of 20 to 40 degrees and only does water. Uh, DVS advantage does both water and organic vapor temperature range 5 to 60 degrees. And this is the system which uh, can be hooked to a Raman spectrometer as well. Um, the DBS elevated temperature goes to higher temperatures for from um, 20 degrees to 85 degrees and also with a higher temperature preheater. Uh, the DBS advantage has got a standard preheater 
which goes up to two, 200 degrees, whereas the elevated, uh, DPS elevated temperature uh, it can be fitted with a higher temperature uh, preheater, which goes up to 300 degrees as well. Uh, the DVS vacuum, instead of uh, flow of gas, it works with a vacuum. There are two uh, pumps, um, a rotary and turbo pump, attached to the, um, to the system, so it can go down to the vacuum levels of, uh, down to 10 to the minus 7 torr. And uh, this is an ideal system for porous materials as well as measuring the vapor pressure of solids. In terms of regulatory requirements, uh, the system has been recognized by U.S. Pharmacopoeia as well as European Pharmacopoeia. And due to the number of systems uh, working in Japan and China, it is becoming a standard method in Japan and China as well. Just to compare uh, uh, the system with some of the other competitive systems, uh, you can see here the, the, the green line for the competitive system and the blue line for our system, SMS system. Um, at higher temperatures, you will notice that at above 60 degrees, the competitive systems are unable to uh, maintain uh, the relative humidity, whereas with our system, you can even at higher temperatures. Uh, obviously, the higher the temperature, the uh, lower the relative humidity that you can, maximum relative humidity that you can achieve. But in the case of the SMS product, uh, at, high, at above 60 degrees, you can still maintain uh, relative humidity uh, over 80%, 85% relative humidity. Also, another advantage of the SMS product is the uh, Z true zero uh, RH, where in, in this case, on the right-hand side with the poor quality, you can see the, uh, an example for naloxon HCL, where uh, the drying, the desorption curve doesn't return to zero during the drying process. Whereas in the case of SMS product, the uh, desorption uh, uh, curve comes back to zero very started from due to the uh, true zero RH property of the system. Also, the accuracy of the uh, mass flow controllers mean that you can collect uh, data at small intervals, uh, like 0.2 percent relative humidity steps, and here. Uh, I'm trying to show uh, low, medium, high, but there is no reason why you can't collect <clears throat> smaller uh, step relative humidity points uh, all the way through the isotherm. And here is the table of uh, classification for hygroscopic materials. Or, so you can see that the very low levels of uptake uh, down to 0.12 uh, percent is classified for non-hydroscopic uh, material. So it is important for the balance to be able to <clears throat> register very low mass uptakes as well as the mass flow controllers being able to control the flow of uh, uh, vapor concentrations. The system comes with a camera at the bottom of the sample chamber. Uh, obviously, the camera, the colored uh, camera, is useful for processes, um, any changes in the material, including the swelling of more uh, pharmaceutical excipients or collapsing of structures, as well as any degradation or color changes in the sample. Also, hydrate formation and um, the liquescence events can be uh, monitored as well. Uh, <clears throat> a typical example for uh, phase changes and just using a combination of a gravimetric method as well as the uh, Raman spectroscopy and video images 
is for amorphous lactose. Uh, typically, for amorphous lactose, you see a mass drop at a particular relative humidity. And in this case, you can see again, uh, at around 60% relative humidity, the mass um, <clears throat> suddenly drops, which is basically an indication of uh, phase change, amorphous to crystalline phase change. And uh, in this case, it is not reversible because during the second cycle, you see that the profile is quite different to the first cycle. <clears throat> the Raman spectroscopy also shows similar uh, events as, as the relative humidity increases. Um, um, the, 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 the broad hump for the, uh, the Raman spectra, uh, you will see that it will change to well-resolved uh, peaks at above 60%. Uh, relative humidity. The video images also show that the free-flowing powder are basically uh, changing as the material deliquescence uh, goes to crystalline state. <coughs> the analysis software offers, we, we offer uh, three um, suites of macros. The standard one, uh, which includes the a plot manager for plotting all the mass data and the, the isotherm uh, analysis software, um, basically plotting the isotherms, the option desorption isotherms, and uh, uh, baseline corrections if you're running a long experiment and if there are any drifts in the baseline, you can correct that. Um, and also, um, if you want to monitor the partial pressure generation or uh, vapor concentration generation, uh, the, the macros allow you to, to compare the target against the uh, actual concentrations. Uh, <clears throat> the more advanced uh, <clears throat> macros will allow you to calculate uh, spreading pressure, BT surface area, heat absorption, diffusion coefficient, and activation energy of diffusion, uh, which is basically to show you uh, the energy barrier um, uh, for, the, for the vapor to get into the material, and therefore the stability and shelf life of the material. Not some vapor pressure will allow the vapor, uh, so, uh, vapor pressure for solids, uh, to measure the vapor pressure for solids, and the also activity plot is basically uh, maintaining uh, the relative humidity constant and uh, changing the temperature. The amorphous content is, uh, uh, is a very popular macro for um, uh, <clears throat> for more and food materials. Obviously, monitoring the amorphous content in these materials and permeability uh, macro for packaging materials. Also, the isotherm analysis software um, uh, offers a range of uh, macros for um, uh, analyzing and fitting different equations into the uh, isotherm. Um, BT, again, BT surface area, GAB, which is an extension of uh, the uh, BET equation, uh, as well as the DF, uh, the DR um, is the basically the macro for pore volume determination, micro pore mesopore size distribution, uh, also possible with these macros with the organic vapor option, uh, and a series of other equations including Langmuir and uh, Young and Nelson, which are basically ideal. Uh, for uh, determining the monolayer or multilayer uh, processes. In terms of applications uh, for food materials, um, moisture-induced morphology changes in food ingredients and products, of course, is an important um, uh, uh, process. 
stability and shelf life of food materials, uh, rapid isotherms uh, compared to the old techniques available uh, like the JAR method. Uh, you can quickly uh, achieve full isotherms using the DBS. Moisture absorption and um, uh, uh, expulsion uh, or drawing effects for food materials. And uh, for the, in terms of the packaging materials, diffusion into food packaging materials. Pharma applications similar to food stability testing, uh, as well as uh, formulation for uh, the interaction between the drug and the uh, excipients, characterization of amorphous content uh, in the food in the pharmaceutical materials similar to food materials and moisture-induced morphology changes, too. <clears throat> and uh, in, uh, for, the, uh, for personal care, um, the, uh, moisture retention uh, for hair and also uh, uh, moisture retention by skin uh, and skin cream uh, uh, performance, as well as contact lenses, uh, which include uh, basically diffusion coefficient measurement and, um, uh, and permeability measurement. Super absorbents like diapers are also, we have many customers in this area too. Uh, for a packaging material, again, uh, uh, electronic comp components or pill capsules and blister packaging materials can be uh, just used in the sample chamber as they come uh, and um, uh, and uh, any vapor uh, uh, going through the packaging material uh, can be uh, the diffusion and permeability can be measured. Other applications include fuel cells, uh, proton exchange uh, membrane fuel cells, fabrics and fibers, the interaction between fragrances and uh, fabrics, washing powders, for example, building materials very popular, cements, wood insulation materials, and agriculture, uh, pesticides, vapor pressure of solids, and also seed and fertilizer release. They all have applications in DVS. A typical uh, uh, mass data includes basically a, a drawing stage uh, followed by steps, uh, any intervals that you like, but typically 10% relative humidity, and then coming down the, during the desorption and the second cycle, uh, which basically shows whether the process is reversible or irreversible. Uh, the, the, the isotherms are basically formed uh, by using the uh, concentration data and the mass data. So the absorption and desorption isotherms and the difference between the, uh, the gap between the desorption and desorption will give you a wide range of information, for example, here that tells you that the, the water, the moisture get into the bulk of the material and judging by the uptake, uh, the, uh, the, the vapor is getting into the bulk of the material, but the process is reversible as it comes back to zero. Different types of uh, isotherms will obviously give you additional information. Here, typically, this type will show you microporous materials, uh, straight uh, uptake, and then comes to a plateau. Whereas these two, uh, uh, type 2 and type 4, will give you the information about the monolayer level as well as the multilayer level. And these are the ones that are used for uh, BT surface area measurements. Type 3, type 5 are sorry, typical of um, uh, condensation uh, uh, on the surface of the material. And this is how basically the vapors, if the vapors are interacting with the surface of the material, they form a monolayer and then followed by multilayers. And this is where uh, you can use the monolayer for BT surface area calculations. Whereas in the case of the uh, condensation, uh, the cluster formation on the surface, which is not ideal for um, for BT surface area calculations. Um, typical 
capillary condensation for mesoporous materials. This is the kind of isotherm that you will see for uh, mesoporous materials with capillary condensation. And uh, again, uh, for hydrate formation, a reversible hydrate, you see a sudden jump in, in uptake due to, to uh, <clears throat> uh, hydrate formation. And typically, the isotherms form this rectangular shape, hysteresis, uh, which uh, um, basically is reversible. And no matter how many times you repeat the experiment, you will see this, this effect. If it wasn't reversible, the irreversible form, you'll see that the narrowing of the hysteresis, uh, in this case, if you repeat it again uh, um, for the third time, it, this will probably na go narrower still. Or moisture retention during hydrate formation, again, for uh, lactose, in this case, you can see that the uh, uh, isotherm doesn't come back to zero. Uh, some of the moisture is retained, uh, and the isotherms also show an open open loop system where uh, they don't come back to zero. Another method is the ramping method, where you can see any changes in the material uh, by ramping the relative humidity at a, um, a particular ramping rate, typically 5% per hour. And then you see that, uh, an increase in water absorption um, uh, due to surface absorption, followed by slowing down as the material goes from a, a glassy to a rubbery uh, state, and then a sharper increase in, in the uptake, followed by the uh, loss in water due to the um, lowering of the water capacity uh, and recrystallization. Uh, here's another example for a stability of the material as uh, sucrose at uh, the crystallization, uh, relative humidity for the crystallization of su sucrose uh, is typically at 50% relative humidity, but as you add protein, BSA, uh, the stability it, it goes to higher relative humidity. So with 11% protein added to sucrose, the crystallization point moves from 50% RH to 70% RH. And as you increase the amount of protein, uh, this moves further to the higher relative humidities as well. And the video image just showed that uh, to uh, the free-flowing powder uh, at 0% relative humidity, gradually the equations becomes crystallized and the equations at higher relative humidity. Different methods available, cycling methods, for example, you keep increasing and decreasing the relative humidity and see the changes. Some of the moisture is retained as you, every time you increase the relative humidity and come back to zero. And this is uh, more obvious in the, the uh, absorption desorption isotherms where you see uh, the free-flowing free powder shows an open uh, loop hysteresis, but as the material cakes, this loop closes. Polymorph differences between polymorph A, polymorph B, very obvious uh, difference in, in the total uptake, uh, very low for polymorph B, but significantly higher for polymorph A, going to over 4%. Heat absorption measurements will give you information about the absorption mechanism, and uh, it, in this case, you need to do the same experiment at two or three different temperatures. Um, and uh, from these results, you can see, for example, here that the heat absorption is very close to the heat of condensation for water. Therefore, the conclusion is here the water molecules are condensing on the surface rather than interacting with the surface of the material. Also, for some membranes, you'll see here um, that the heat of uh, absorption for um, this type uh, N112 membrane is greater than the NR112 membrane indicating that the interaction with the surface is higher for this, this film uh, compared to the, the other film. But at some stage, at higher relative humidities or higher coverages, both come to the same level, indicating the condensation of water on the surface. Uh, amorphous content determination, I won't spend much time on it, but just to, to show you one method, uh, one, there are four methods available. 
uh, typically you measure the uptake before and after the crystallization. So for that, you would need to find the vapor that causes crystallization in the material. Uh, in this case, water doesn't seem to cause any changes in the material. Uh, and therefore, we move to organic vapor, acetone, where you can see that as you, as a particular relative humidity, uh, vapor concentration, the mass drop shows the uh, amorphous to crystalline phase transformation. Once the vapor that causes the <coughs> crystallization is found, then you can use this method and uh, measuring the uptake before the crystallization stage and then uh, taking the material through the crystallization process where the mass loss occurs and then measuring the uptake again at this level. So this is the crystalline and this is the mixture of amorphous and crystalline. Any difference in the uptake will uh, basically correspond to the amorphous content of the material. The method is uh, uh, much more uh, precise than um, XRD or DSC. So uh, uh, detection limit of 0.2% is much better than uh, the other techniques uh, available. Uh, and also you don't need a high level of sample mixing homogeneity and sample preparation as required with other techniques and you can just use the sample as it is. Uh, you, you only need a, a, an amorphous material as a standard to draw a calibration curve. Diffusion measurements for packaging material, blister packaging, just uh, hanging the uh, blister packaging as it is with the tablet in, uh, in, the, um, in the sample chamber, and you can see that diffusion increases, diffusion coefficient increases as the uh, uh, vapor concentration increases. Other accessories available for the system include the diffusion cell where you can sandwich a film material in between the seal, uh, seals um, in a cup where you can have uh, moisture gather uh, material like zeolite or you can have water. So any, if you have water in the cup, any water escaping through the film can be measured as mass loss. Or if you have moisture gather material in this cup, any moisture uh, encouraged to pass through the film and be absorbed by the, the zeolite tablet. Uh, will show uh, an increase in mass and therefore from there you can measure the diffusion rate and also the water vapor flux or permeability in the, in the material. Typical examples, lemonine or ethyl acetate, amyl acetate, these are flavoring materials uh, which can pass through the packaging materials for food, food stuff. Uh, and also the same technique can be used to measure the water activity for food materials too. And we've done a series of food materials including honey, corn, starch, uh, 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 and uh, ketchup uh, and so on. And the literature value uh, and our value agree are in very good agreement. Uh, hair differences, damaged hair or uh, treated hair, bleached hair, heat treated hair, they all can be distinguished using the technique by the differences in mass uptake. Uh, building materials, um, one cement, you can see the uh, picks up moisture very late, uh, whereas the other type of cement very quickly, therefore you can just find out the uh, shelf life or stability of the uh, different types of cement, for example. Other building materials, wood, a chunk of wood, and the uh, uh, difference between uh, uh, sawdust and chunk of wood, for example. A uh, chunk of wood is more difficult for water vapor to get into, so water uptake would be um, relatively lower, whereas in the, the same sort of wood in a, in a form of sawdust, uh, the ha much higher uptake due to better diffusion through the powder form. Again, different sample geometries, uh, in this case for food material, uh, different, uh, the same biscuit uh, can be either crushed or be used as a chunk of, uh, or different pieces of biscuit. And obviously, you know, when, when you have it as a powder, uh, the diffusion is much better into the powder and the uptake would be higher. Uh, 
Uh, again, the sample ch chamber allows you to um, uh, hang large samples from the hanged on wire, uh, as well as a, a bigger manifold, which can be added as a, an accessory to the to the manifold and measure even larger samples than this. So, uh, if you have a bigger volume, we have an attachment for the sample chamber to allow you to measure even bigger volume samples as well. Uh, other examples, which I won't spend much time on, include the uh, restoration of, uh, uh, of different materials, different uh, uh, projects. In this case, is the Swedish warship BASA, where you can basically compare any uh, material, new materials that are being used for the restoration compared to the original material that were found in the original warship. Also, heavy water can be used in the system to monitor, uh, basically to trace the uh, uh, interaction uh, or replacement of water with heavy water or the, to investigate the functional groups on the surface of the material. Um, building industry, uh, a lot of interest uh, in the DVS for the building industry because building materials, uh, uh, building companies are obliged to reduce their carbon footprint and move to more uh, biomaterials, and in this case, uh, we have a lot of different universities concentrating on straws and uh, uh, basically more natural materials, and they need to monitor the temperature and changes in the humidity uh, uh, and the insulation properties of these materials. And one of the other uh, properties that can be measured for these materials include the porosity measurement as the straw and hem, they are porous materials, and with this system, you can also measure the pore size distribution, as it is for the straw sample here, you can, uh, which is typical microporous material isotherm. So I think with that, I'll, uh, I will end the presentation and go straight to the questions. Uh, we have a question. Um, how do you get a faster equilibrium with high RH values? Well, there are <clears throat> different different methods. Uh, basically, if you it depends on the nature of your material. Really, if uh, if you have a powder available or a tablet, obviously, uh, the, as you saw with the examples, the tablet, uh, the diffusion into the tablet, but is much slower. Um, than the, the powder form, um, but the, one of the advantages of our system is the accuracy of the balance, the micro balance, and the ability to use very small amount of sample, therefore basically uh, increasing the kinetics and uh, improving the kinetics. Uh, but at the same time, there are other parameters that you can uh, change, uh, including use of helium, uh, the carrier gas, which will improve the diffusion into the into the material. That's the end of the questions, and I thank you very much for listening uh, to this presentation.